This conference will now be recorded. So, how is everyone? Good morning. Awesome. Excellent. I'm getting some thumbs up and some OKs. Um, we've got most of our support staff here, at least the technical guys. How about you, Danny? How you been? I'm doing better. Uh, getting better every day. Okay, I, uh, man. I, I had a little <laughs> flare up back about three months ago. I turned a four wheeler over and they flew me to Duke. Spent a month there in the hospital, uh, and I learned what it is to be without any pride. Well, I tell you what, man. Yeah, you were telling me about that last, you know, on, on the last one, and I was just amazed, you know, uh, because you you came out of that uh, all in all. I mean, wow. I'll put it this way. I probably wouldn't want to find you on a dark alley and try to push your buttons one night or take your wallet. Um, it, you wallet. You took a beating on that <laughs> big time and big time. kept right on ticking. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad you're getting better, man. That's that's bad. My father-in-law had a motorcycle crash on the interstate a couple months back. And he was laid up pretty good for a while, too. So uh, I, I saw some of his pain. I can imagine the kind of knee you went through. That's that's something good to be back. I'm glad you are. So anywho, um, anybody got any noteworthy, um, mentions or topics or want to say hi, or anybody new that wants to pop in. And I think we pretty much got everybody. <sighs> and then there's that road boss guy. We better let him have a few words here right up front. How you, man? Hey, what's going on? Stop it, Chris. <laughs> what was it? Nothing. I was telling Chris to behave. Happy Which one? Birthday to you. <laughs> Not yet. You gotta be kidding me. It's Brian's um, birthday. No, well, I, I don't I don't I, I promise you I don't do that. I don't do my birthday. I just don't, but I appreciate it. You don't get a choice. You don't get a choice. Just like you didn't get a choice to be born. We're going to celebrate. When's your birthday, Brian? Today. Oh, happy birthday. (laughs) Happy birthday, Brian. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have an old duels after work. I don't want to, I don't want to start too early. Mine's right around the corner. So yeah, I'm wearing blue flannel in honor of your birthday. Awesome. Uh, look, I'm doing that thing with the red shirt too, man. Did you, <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you know? We got to get you a thunder hat. So, anywho, thanks, guys. Um, so, what do y'all want to talk about? Are, was that a thumbs up? Well, on I, do have, I we can do have. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Sorry, Brian. I do have a, a pretty quick question. Um, the problem that we're having right now is the designing in light burn, but also the merging of something from say Photoshop. Um, we're trying to sublimate onto the Unisub plastic single-sided wood backed uh, blanks, but in order to get like a an even white border around the design, well the cut is obviously perfect because it's the laser and that's what it's supposed to do. But the problem that I come in with is the designing it in Photoshop, I don't know how to make that picture the exact same size to be able to fit into my whiteboard from the laser, and that's that's been a difficult problem last week. And trying to dial it in and get it perfect. I mean, once I get the formula figured out, I think it'll be a lot easier. But right now. Yeah, you cut out a little bit, but I think we got the gist of it. Um, as far as sizing, if you're bringing it in, um, you can just scale it, you know, and use the two. I guess it depends on if you're, is your cut line in there with it? Or are you masking it with a cut line or, or how's that set up? Well, what, what we did is I designed the whole thing in light burn first because that gives me my cut lines, that gives me my color lines of what color I want where. And then I bring that and I export it out of Lightburn and I import it into uh, Photoshop. But then somehow when I pull it into Photoshop, the the size of it isn't direct. 
perfectly whatever. It's not perfect. Like say I design a whatever five by three, and then I pull it into Photoshop. It's not five by three in Photoshop. Point seven eight six by two point whatever. I don't know. It's just it's off a little bit. So then now when I color code it in Photoshop and then print that out on the sublimation paper and then go to stamp that onto the design is a different size. And I don't know why it is because when you export it, shouldn't it export it at the exact size that you had it? Are you exporting as SVG? Uh, I believe so. Yes. I'm, I'm almost positive. Yes. Yeah, right so there's, yeah, there's different formats of SVG as far as DPI, so that could be causing you a conversion ratio um, of those two. What you really ought to do is just in your editing software, if you was 3x5, why not just go ahead and scale up that SVG to 3x5? It's really, you know, the benefit of vector graphic is it's easy to scale, right? So go ahead and group everything and scale it up to whatever size you need. different ideas to what I've been trying to do so okay cool all right scale it up that's a good idea and, and to make it more more simple you can even put a box around it and then just scale that box up if it's all grouped together scale the box up the box should make everything internally also equal to whatever the uh, you want it to be that's what I did at first I made a box but then now, my second question on making the box is, is it the inside of the line on the box or the outside of the line on the box? Or that, that again, is where I'm having a hard time trying to figure it out. I, I only spent five or ten minutes trying to dial it in, but it, it just it, it wasn't as easy as I thought it was. I thought when I designed it in one, again, a five by three pulling it over into the other, it should have been a five by three at the same time. And it wasn't. So test out, um, test out a DXF first. Uh, I bring a lot of stuff over to my plasma cutter and DXF and that, that software is really crappy and uh, it all seems to be sized correctly. So it might, you might have better luck that way. Okay. All right, cool. Thanks. Awesome. Um, Anybody else got anything? Any questions or comments? If you do, uh, yeah, George raised his hand. Sorry, it takes me a second to hit mute. Uh, so I recently uh, recalibrated my mirrors on the machine. I noticed I was getting uh, faded engravings when I was all the way in the farthest corner away from the laser. And as you progressively move into the bed closer to, so the beam doesn't have to travel as far, that my engravings were getting darker and darker and more consistent. So when you recalibrate, there's those tiny little gold screws and they have the set screw on the inside. Then there's the silver screw that I guess is like a lock. Mm -hmm. What order do you guys unlock and relock the mirrors in? Because I watched so, a couple of videos, and it's not 100% clear. Yeah, so you'll want to release the silver screws first. Those are exactly what you said. They just bind that plate or that mount just enough to set those brass thumb screws, even, even though they have stop nuts on them so that it'll hold that in place so the first thing you want to do is release the tension you know on those silver ones um and then you release the stop nuts and then you turn the thumb screws to affect the adjustment and then tighten back down the stop nuts and then on you know the very last part gently 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 put just a very little bit of pressure on on the silver screws as a last step because if you crank them down too much you know, it's going to override where the brass fitting is and you're just going to knock it out of whack again because you put too much elbow grease in it. So what I did was I left the silver screws alone and instead I just gave uh, a little extra oomph on the lock uh, brass nut while still holding with another pair of pliers the, the adjustment screw. 
and I'm hoping that that's gonna keep him in place. I mean, we'll know in, I guess, a couple of weeks. I got another big job coming up. Mm-hmm. But thank you. Uh, sure, sure. Um, anybody else have any topics or questions or comments? And Mike, it looks like you're talking, but I'm not hearing you on my end. I don't think. Yeah, I didn't hear anything either. It's it's not it's not grayed out, but it's not. Uh, I don't know if it shows up green. Let me try this. I'm gonna unmute request and see if it'll pop back up. Let's see. Yeah, I still don't get anything. I'll let you tinker with that for just a minute. You can call in somehow. I don't know where to get the number <laughs> to tell you where to call in. It's probably in somewhere in here. I could post it. Uh, and George, I did see your message. I, I usually don't look at the chat, but I saw it. Chris, you got something, man? Mr. Myers? You know what we forgot to do? Yeah, he said, Mike said in the chat he can hear us, but we can't hear him. Yeah, I don't know. I guess that's going to be something on your end. Um, if you can get that figured out, unless you want to type it in and we'll we'll talk it out that way, uh, if you want to give that a shot. Chris, were you saying what something? We, oh, gonna... What we forgot to do is tell Brian happy birthday as a group. <laughs> uh, Brian. Technically, we already did this. Yeah, was we, did, we did. We did. We didn't. We didn't do our introductions because I do see one new face, Julia. Okay. Everybody else looks like a usual. Hi, everybody. I'm Julia. There we go. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. How are you guys? Good. good. I'm, Is that a new machine I'm in Brian. the background that I see? I'm sorry. Yep. Is it a new machine in the background that I see? Uh, it's about a year old. Um, I'm on the boards pretty frequently. I have a little tiny shop called Paisley Fire Designs. I mostly do a home decor kind of stuff. Lots of painted, big, bright, loud pieces. I just posted a really cool thing about a remote holder I made yesterday. I don't know if you guys saw that. That was me. I check that but out. Hi. Hello. What type of remote? Like a TV remote? Yes, we have this little tiny, like, sound bar remote in our living room okay. and it always falls down in the couch and it always falls down in the crack of the recliner which requires like this whole like adventure excavation thing so i did like a three-layered it was the first time i've worked with acrylic really i did a three-layered acrylic like holder thing i don't know where it is i think i took it in the other room um and just did some inlay work and so anyways i just been i just wanted to join the thursday calls to just i'm interested in learning more about my machine awesome cool. awesome cool so yeah mike was thanking me for the the air valve and he made a great video did you see it chris's <laughs> i'll just no. say chris's uh he put the piece of paper in front of the nozzle so you could actually see the amount of flow it was having in the video and that was a great little pro tip so we can start using that i asked him if we can use the video in an article uh at some point because there's not anything uh he said he's going to try to disconnect and come back there i don't think there's anything that we'd need to obfuscate or redact in that in that video to show how to uh, test the air you know in an article or something but his video was awesome when he sent it back in uh, that made me happy you'll have to watch it if you hadn't guys in the whoever's in the support system but anywho um well, what about Rich? I don't think we've had Rich here before. Looks like another new user. I'm doing a shaver yeah. job. You know, I, I've been watching you guys on um, the older videos for for quite a while now. We've we've been looking at lasers for, gosh, probably two years. Um, I actually had my heart set on a Epson or a Epilog, mm -hmm. and we actually went up to uh, Kansas City and uh, had the demo and all that there. And uh, I mean, it's a nice machine and all, don't get me wrong, but when he showed me the price tag, it's like, no, <laughs> we're not doing a laser. 
<laughs> so uh, I, I can't remember what got me onto Thunder, but uh, I, yeah, I think it was during our research in uh, like what we saw. Um, started talking to Rhonda. She has been extremely helpful. Yep. Um, and we actually placed our order last week. So we've got awesome. a 51, 130 coming. Sweet. Welcome to the Thunder fam. Thank you, guys. So, uh, and if you have any questions or comments or anything like that, be sure and let us know. That's the primary function of this. Um, well, and then we, I, no, I do ahead. have a newbie question. Um, even though I don't have my machine, in looking at some of your past uh, weekly tech webinars, um, you all had been talking uh, over a couple of them about uh, the delay, the eight-second delay that you guys have mostly set on your fans. Mm -hmm. And I've been racking my brain exactly where does that come into use? Why would you do that versus having it automatically kick on right away? So the fan uh, actually does kick on right away. So that's not really the rub. Uh, the fan kicks on the same time as the job kicks on to start. The problem is, is with those inline uh, axial fans, uh, it's got a little weak DC motor in it and they take a while to spool up to move the volume of air that they're capable of and, and supposed to be moving. So it appears that there's a delay because it doesn't move smoke for the first couple seconds. So gotcha. what the, what the uh, start delay does in light burn is makes it so that the machine will get a signal to go ahead and energize, but it will not actually send a command to start make the job happen for what until whatever that amount of time is so you're delaying the job so that the machine comes on and has time for the laser to spool up before the job actually starts to run if that makes sense it does it makes perfect sense thank you the fan to spool up brian i think is what you meant to say the fan yeah. not the laser <laughs> the yeah, fan. yeah i knew what you meant yeah. yep thank you yeah. though so yeah and that they just added that recently now that we've had the tl timer forever uh, that handles the the off timer so the air assist and the exhaust will also stay on for 10 or 15 seconds after the job is done to evacuate any remaining smoke and that's already built in but there just wasn't a way in the hardware to make a start delay so we were glad when lightburn added that all right makes sense thanks Sorry, I was looking at another ticket. I like the awkward silence every once in a while. So, let's put CeeLo on the spot. Tell us something good, man. Something good. Um, working with the Chuck Rotary. I think I'm going to start doing that tomorrow on the Aurora and try to really dial in the settings and then produce some literature about it. Kind of excited about that, oddly enough. It's satisfying. I'm excited about it too, because we need some of coins, that stuff. And I'm, I'm really, I'm really liking the, I'm really liking the coins. You're burning one right now. I see. Are you yes, working on? There's one going. A thunder coin for Grant. Throw it to the salespeople. Yeah. And that door is photoshopped open. He would never condone the use of that machine uh, with the enclosure not in its no, place. No. So that was. <laughs> do we do about? a whole lot of do what I say, not as I do around here, but. Usually we don't record it. <laughs> I'm just picking. I run mine up too. Matter of fact, that uh, config file that I have has it with the interlocks defeated. So, hey Brian, you just brought up a great point. So when I went okay. to calibrate my mirrors, I learned how to put my machine into uh, safety disable mode. Mm -hmm. A little button on the control panel that. Hey, you open the door and the laser's still going, right? It, it, it disables yep. that. But button number six. Yes. Yeah. You shut the machine down. You turn the machine back on. Is that safety still disabled? Or does no. it reset every time you turn on the machine? It will reset if you cycle the power on the machine. Okay. Or if, if you, you press, press button again. six again, you can turn it off that way also. If you don't want to turn your power off and on, you can push this button again and it'll be active again but yeah th it's built in so that that's the whole reason that board is there instead of just just a switch to bypass it is so that when you do power it off and back on it'll reset back to its default you know uh, safeties have them uh, have them not defeated as a default you know as a precaution 
So even if you forget. So the way my machine's set up here in the shop, the far side over here is where the control panel is, and that's up against the wall. Mm -hmm. So anytime I need to do anything, I have to slide the machine back out. Get it out. Get all the feet up. and So I'm starting to look at, I would never want to permanently disable that. Wink, wink. Yeah, there's hint, hint. <laughs> yeah. There's, there are methods on the internet on how to defeat it. Like my machine didn't have the maintenance board in it, so I ran a wire to the WP in the ground terminal, uh, and I just used a phone jack and just shorted it down. So when I plug it in, safety is defeated. Then I can pull it out, you know, and carry it with me or whatever if I if I just want to. Kind of like those safety keys on a drill press, you know what I mean? Kind of kind of that kind of thing is the way I had it had it set up. Or just do it light burn. Uh, you could, you could, you could do it in light burn. Ooh. You could disable it in the configuration settings, uh, but then that means they're disabled even if you get your switches fixed or put them back in or don't want them disabled, unless you go in and change it in the software. So, but six of one, half a dozen of the other, that'll still get you defeated. But I, I won't give you that you wouldn't disable the safety switch in the seat of your lawnmower, would you, speech? So, because this is this is a laser. <laughs> but I don't want to take off my finger. Yeah, I, I run mine with the door up quite often, so I leave I leave my mine defeated also. You know, and if it was public facing, if I were in um uh, where I had employees and things, I'd probably be donning the proper PPE, some protective eyewear just for due diligence just for you know instilling that kind of so you don't get complacent you know if you are going to run with it open but most of the time you don't need them or just have it not use it <laughs> yeah and then speaking of which for the um, the machine disabling features behind that uh panel in the front underneath where the handle is there's a four sets of four louvers to allow air to flow into the machine. And then there's on the back side of that, there's almost like another metal cover. Mm -hmm. I guess that's used to direct the air flow it, better. That I think is a baffle, uh, the FAA, uh, the not the FAA, the uh, FDA, FDA needs to be there to block uh, any spurious emissions from the laser from going through the louvers. So it could not be considered a class two device with the lids down if that wasn't there because you'd be able to see through the louvers. See what I mean? And, and you wouldn't be protected from any. So uh, ha, if you're getting that, can people take that off and get better airflow? Possibly. Uh, matter of fact, I don't leave mine's my door. You know, you can take it out. Mine's leaning it up in the corner behind the machine and I just leave it out and, and just let the air go in that way. So that's an option, too especially if you use the bypass a lot, so you don't drop that thing on your foot. <laughs> so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions, anybody? <laughs> I have a question. Got that silence going. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have a Nova 24 60 watt and when I first got my machine, I thought that I couldn't cut half inch and I have been cutting, I cut half inch almost every single day now. Um, Brian, I know that you had mentioned before with these, um, the, with thunder lasers that it's fine that I can run my laser all day at 90% and it's not going to hurt the tube any more than anything else. Is that because when you mentioned that on the boards, people go insane and say, stop, you have to stop running your laser that long at that high right. of a power. Yeah, even at 100%, you can run it, and it won't exceed the manufacturer's uh, maximum current rating for operational use. Now, okay. Great. does that mean does that mean that the harder you run it, it doesn't it it won't you know make it uh, fail faster or the life? It does affect it. You know, sure. Just the same way if you baby a car, it'll last longer than if you ride it hard and you're out delivering paper, you know, and you're really on the go with it. But a lot of people consider a lot of that in the in the the being a consumable 
you know, having the tube be a consumable, they'll run it at 100% power because they want to output lots of product really fast. Say they're cutting things and, you know, piece count matters. They don't mind burning them up in a year and paying for another four or $500 tube because they've already accounted for that in the call, you know, uh, in the jobs to begin with, just like you would shop rags or vinyl or any other consumable that you may use. So, uh, but yes. It's just the tube that it's going to affect as far as, well, the power supplies do get taxed because they're they're making thirty thousand volts, and that's a pretty that's a pretty hot supply. So there are some things in there that can go supernova, you know, just because you're dealing with those crazy transformers and stuff in there. But the tube, you expect what two to five years, uh, one to five years, depending if you push them really really hard. But that's pretty uncommon. Usually, two to five years is a good number. You know, uh, they say two to four, I think, or 2,000 hours to 4,000 hours. I don't know how they compute that, but I'm sure they have some data, you know, uh, about it. Um, but, yeah, you can run it at 90% all day long and you don't have to worry about it being burned up in six months. Um, okay. Where you see people concerned about that or people say, oh, you've got to have your meter up front and watch it all the time, you know, that kind of thing, is a lot of those lasers aren't calibrated for the factory. They put in the tube, they put in the power supply, and they send it down the road. Um, whereas each of ours are calibrated, you know, at the factory, each tube and power supply, and they're all okay. standardized to different machines. So we can have intelligent, more intelligent conversations about speed and power and things like that. There's never an easy button. There's always going to be variances depending on your environment and, you know, situation, but you can get pretty close talking about speed and power that way since they are, you know, standard, standardized that way. Okay. But yeah, Thanks. you're fine. Run it that way. Um, you should be great. And on an over 24, the tubes aren't terribly expensive anyway. <laughs> so yeah. on, on 130, they're a little bit, a little bit more. <laughs> I got a question on the uh, power or the, the, the power usables. Uh, okay. Um, when you, you got your two switches, the first one that turns on basically the laser, except the tube itself, the, the operational part. When you press the lower one, what wear and tear if you're not burning something is there because I, I normally turn it off if i'm just yeah i just do random stuff i right. don't so for, right so so yeah the main power switch turns on just about everything uh except for like you said the laser power supply i'll tell you the uh that second switch the laser switch contacts or, or energizes that contactor that's in there that thunks every time you turn it on and off and that powers the chiller and the laser power supply those are the only two things on that circuit so you're right the idea normally as it's wired is you can turn the leave the laser power switch off until you're ready to actually burn a project and that way you can be sending files to the machine and jog and set your origin and then when you're ready to actually fire the laser then you can turn the laser power switch off so your chiller's not running you know when it doesn't need to be um, and, and so that it won't fire, um, you know, without you wanting it to, it's also a safety. So okay. sometimes when it these only takes me between 10 minutes between just things I do, should I oh, power it off? You don't, no, no, just, no, don't, don't cycle that thing on and off. That's worse than just leaving it on. If okay. you're going to be that fast. That's if you're not going to be burning anything for 30, 45 minutes, an hour, something like okay. that, you know, you can, you can kill it. But if you're working during the day, a lot of people don't even turn those off. You just, it, the only thing that's running is the chiller. And if you're not burning anything with the laser, it's not going to be in a compression cycle very often because it's not going to be heating up. It's just going to be sitting there idle. Fans okay. will be running. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm just looking at the info over here again. I'm getting a lot of notifications. So, oh yeah, they were mentioning about uh, cleaning the exhaust fan uh, in the chat. That's definitely a good idea. What about, should we talk about the antifreeze? I know I mentioned that. Um, last year, <clears throat> it kind of didn't have a whole lot on it. And then that freeze happened in Texas and we had to write some stuff really quick. Uh, when was that last year or the year before? How long have I been here now? I don't even know. Uh, should have been two years ago because that was the big was years ago. freeze and everything. Yeah, yeah, it was two years ago. Wow, the time's fly. Um, so we have official recommendations for that um, 
stuff, that fluid that I've never heard of before. Uh, it, it looks like more of an industrial um, solution to me, and we're seeing that it's hard to find. And there's a lot of talk about the RV antifreeze, the pink stuff, the glycol-based stuff. And I've used that in my machines, not Thunders, um, but in other machines, and it's worked fine for a long time. Um, and that's what we have been, I have to say, unofficially recommended for people because it works. But we don't, we can't approve it until the chiller manufacturer and the tube manufacturers and Thunder all say it's okay to use that stuff. <coughs> And people have been using it for 20 years, and they haven't said it's okay yet. So I don't know why, but if you were to use the RV antifreeze in a Thunder and something were to happen to the tube or something happened to the water pump in the chiller, they may not warrant it if it's under warranty because it was running a fluid that was not approved, if that makes sense. So we're in a conundrum because we either have to recommend a coolant or an additive that is hard to find and expensive, uh, or we have to recommend something that's not official that may affect warranty conditions and things like that. So that's our rub with the whole antifreeze thing. Now, the um, OEM manufacturer, Tayu Chiller, says to use automotive antifreeze, and I've always, always, always heard that's terrible because it's super corrosive to the parts in these cooling systems. Uh, and even they say, use it for the season and then dump it out, you know, flush the system regularly. Don't just let that stuff sit in. But the RV antifreeze is not corrosive to the system from what an, I understand. It's an anti-corrosive anti and a lubricant. Yeah. yeah. And they, they were worried about, you know, uh, how conductive it was. And I did some tests on some and, I don't even know if I still have that conductivity meter. Uh, that thing was kind of neat. Um, and, it, and it was passing. So, you know, in a pinch, I'd go to Walmart and get the pink stuff, even though, you know, and we'll deal with it. But I'm trying to get more information. Uh, I'm trying to get a secondary, you know, some, some alternate types, you know, uh, or solutions so can... besides just that one. No, I brought this up before and I actually did a little test on it. but um. You can get one of those little uh, fish aquarium heaters and a small DC water pump to put in line, and you can get like a an UPS power supply. Like I think I used a 1,000, and it ran for like two or three days yeah. off of that before it even drained the battery. So I mean, and it kept the temperature at about 50. 50 something degrees. Um, Cause I tried it in the winter down here. I mean, obviously Fahrenheit, in Florida didn't right. get that cold, but. <laughs> but yeah. uh, and I've, I've heard thing. of the heaters. Uh, yeah, I got a video on it, but um, it seemed pretty. I mean, it's pretty reliable. I mean, now, obviously, if you're without power for like a week, <laughs> that might be an issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, if but, it's that catastrophic, you drain it. If I mean, you know, as a last resort, yeah. you know, pull out your knife and cut uh, the hoses, blow through the chiller so it gets out of the pump. But, yeah, but at least it'll get you through. Yeah, <laughs> figuring out what you need um, to do. You know? But yeah, I think when and there's all kinds, all manner of engineered fluids, you know, ferrofluids and stuff that are made for this industry. If we could ever find some that was affordable um, and that we could get certified that would use, you know. Maybe I could get Chris, Chris's uh, to get a little bunch of little bottles and just take a 55 gallon drum and make little bottles out of it. They don't look real happy about that. But we'll, <laughs> maybe we can find some sort of solution um, f for, you know, they use it in like computer coolers and, and that stuff doesn't freeze. Uh, but they make all kinds of, of fluids like that that'll, that won't freeze, that won't, you know, conduct electricity, that'll be perfect. Um, I don't see any downside with of the pink stuff unless it's the viscosity tax in the pump and the sensor, you know, the water flow sensor. I have never used the, the pink stuff in a Thunder, and it's been a while since I've seen it, but it's not thick. It's not like lotion or something like that, but it has to be more viscous than distilled water. I haven't had an issue, and I've run it in my machines for years. The RV, yeah. the the pink RV stuff. Yeah. So Light Object will sell a heater, seventy-five bucks. Yeah. There Not is that. Bad. 
that heater. Uh, even, I wish it had a pump in it, but he, it, me and Marco talked about that for a little while. It, if it didn't stay primed, it was one thing, but the pump that's sitting at the bottom and there's a tube at the top, you know, and I think it would stay primed, but now the art SNA has an option for a heater in their chiller also, Built but in. I think you have to buy the chiller with the heater in it. They won't sell a retro kit. Well, for 75 bucks, here's the retro kit. I mean, yeah. this plugs into a 120 uh, even, feature. We have to leave the chiller stuff. running the whole time. Even, even cheaper yeah. something that we do here in, in Florida with, with our palm trees is we put a blanket over them and we have a high wattage light bulb in one of those old fashioned clamp on thing. Mm -hmm. And we put that inside underneath the palm tree to keep it warm so it doesn't freeze to death. So even, even using a high wattage bulb in the back of by the tube should keep it warm enough in that compartment that it won't freeze the tube won't yeah right they, I, yeah. I also wonder and i don't it, it may not even be a thing but i wonder about the stuff in the chiller you know the the pump and the water flow sensor if it has water in it it's not evacuated that stuff's plastic it wouldn't take anything to pop the pump or the true the sensor off. but well i haven't i haven't heard of any cases of one um being damaged by a freeze though I, I don't think i've ever replaced a faulty uh, i mean a pump that or a sensor that wasn't because it just went bad you know it wasn't because it had a crack in it i've never seen one so maybe it doesn't happen of course you can bring your chiller inside a lot of times if you're gonna leave it unhooked for an extended amount of time you'd probably bring it in gonna well what we'll caught him off last year was or two years ago was the lack of power as well right so they hit a deep freeze and the lack of power so you know, pumping and aquarium heaters does nothing for you 100 watt bulbs does nothing for you the best thing you do in that situation is there's a drain plug on the back of the chiller you've got two dollars and fifty cents worth of distilled water in that setup right just pull the drain plug let it drain out and be done with it save yourself you know, a thousand bucks in tubes and all that there's jazz. a thing called a mr buddy heater 20 pound propane cylinder no electricity pumps out a shit ton of heat yep i'm back my mouth sorry uh, <laughs> who's that happy birthday yeah, but see, I'd, I'd, I'd rather mr heater mr buddy heater be heating my buns versus having worried about a laser tube that i can't even run I in that situation one. I have a dedicated one that sits out in my shop yeah. and it's for emergency backups. And I got, yep. I fill up my propane tanks for my grill at the end of the season. They go to the shop, they sit on the floor. And that way, in case of an emergency, we go power outage. I've got emergency backup heat. And if I have to stay warm, I just go out to the shop and sit warm. Everybody else can stay cold. I've got chisels. I've got hand yeah. planes. I can still be productive. <laughs> or go get stuck in the mud. Hey, we ain't talking about that. Anybody, anyway, since that was late, I stuck on the phone. Did anybody sing Brian Happy Birthday yet? Stop yes. it. <laughs> no, but now that you mention it, I think we ought to. All right, everybody on three. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to, to you. you. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Oh, we're getting this. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, dear Brian. Brian. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, Brian. Dear. Brian's going, why in the hell did he have to show up? That was totally <laughs> worth it. That was totally I worth love, it. I love the signing. That was awesome. Yeah. Great yeah. job, Julia. Well, thank you, guys. Hey, I was a sign Is language interpreter for 25 years. <laughs> Is that 60 now, Brian? Yeah, something like that. 51. What are you talking about? You, you, you can come on down here and find out. How about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get off Brian, my lawn. Not, not quite 60. Brian's yeah. a big 51. Yeah. How do you yeah, know was, more? I don't even know my, I don't even know how old I am. How do I'm you know it? I'm your stalker, Brian. He has a lot See, of time on his hands when he's stuck in the mud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that. Jason got to see, Jason actually stopped by and he got to see some of my mess that I was dealing with. That was an experience. Gotcha. Yeah, these, that, that one there, we had to call the tow truck on. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> hey, come on over. I'm stuck in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Had to call a tow truck. Hey, when you go uh -huh. and stick your bucket in the ground and you have almost 
foot and a half, two foot of water come up in a minute and a half and you're sitting on turquoise clay and that water starts coming up on your tracks and you have nothing but soup below you, you're not getting out of there. Yeah, that sounds like that might be a little bit of a mess. Cool. Well, has anybody else got anything? We got 20 minutes. We have to fill 20 more minutes. I think we can. Well, I, I managed to kill five. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll propose my question that I posed to Loco here a while back. Oh, Remember God. Loco? I did three signs. Two were turned on the x-axis, one was turned on the y-axis. The signs were supposed to be... I'll just throw a number at it. Six by 14. The six inches came out perfectly fine on the x and the y-axis. The 14 inch came out at 14 and a sixteenth and 14 and an eighth. On the same oh, axis like. or on alternate on axes? axes? On upper, on the two of them on the x axis came out of 14 and a 16th, and the one on the y axis came out at 14 and an eighth. But all the six inches on the y axis and all the six inches is on the x axis all come out exactly at six inches. Calibration. The calibration. Yeah, calibration. Huh? The calibration. <laughs> the, the axis yeah, calibration. Yeah, you got to calibrate. Yeah. yeah, but it's the point of it is. The X and Y axis both came out exactly at six axis, six inches. So but the X but and Y axis didn't came at fourteen. So consider this: you're saying you're off by a sixteenth of an inch when you cut a fourteen inch shape. A six inch shape is roughly two and a half times smaller. So take your sixteenth yep. of an inch divided by two point five. Could you measure that reliably, even with calipers, right? Because we can all squeeze calipers, make them read a little bit off. Same thing in the y direction, except for you were instead of sixteenth of an inch, you were an eighth of an inch. So the larger you can actually measure, you know, repeatedly, precisely, accurately, all that. Yeah. Well, and for your calibration, don't calibrate to a one inch square. Calibrate to a five. Calibrate to a ten. Especially if you are of a no sixty three, the bigger you can cut, measure reliably. Jason, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> The bigger you can draw it, you know, if your measuring tool can handle the 10 inches or whatever that you can measure accurately, do that, do your calibration. That will help your smaller objects and your larger objects. We actually had a user that was doing it on one inch, and then he cut like a 24 inch square. He's like, it's off by a quarter inch. Like, yeah, because when you measured at an inch, your percent error was, you know, say 3% of an inch wasn't a whole lot. But when you got 3% of 24 inches, it was noticeable. So, that's probably what you're running into. That's exactly what I was running into. I was just trying to do it. That's why we have engineers. So if people had that problem, I just didn't want to support it. I don't want you guys to explain it because my redneck butt wouldn't explain it correctly. Because it's the same thing as squaring a fence on a table saw. You create a, a sled and you try to do a 24-inch square on a sled, not a 1-inch square on a sled, because it's going to transfer that, that 16th of an inch over 24 inches. It's going to be much larger than it is on a two inch or three inch but i just wanted to bring that up because it was an anomaly that the first time i ever noticed it and the only reason why i did notice it <clears throat> it's because i ran those in two different directions and when i went to stack them up yep. together i'm like whoa wait They're a minute wrong. i'm like why is uh -huh. this so much longer so then i measured it and i'm like huh so did you calibrate it and do they act appropriately on both axes now oh, or have I've you retested it? that because I'm trying to get it down to the thousandths of an inch and <laughs> I can't get it to the thousandths of an inch. I'm like, if I think I did a one inch and I did a five inch and at the five inch, I, if I can't remember, but I think it was 5.001 and 5.099 or something like that on the X and the Y. And it, mm -hmm. I was trying to get it down to... I was going back into light burn, trying to do the readjust, and I have yet yep. to get it down to exactly five and five. And I know that can be your calipers and how you're grabbing onto it, but just for my anal part, well, I wanted it exactly at five. And and yep. you got to take into account curve. the variables of focus and even speed Material. and power can make the curve bigger or smaller by a little bit. Yeah, uh, and curve offset and all of that stuff too. So it's a it's a uh, it's a rabbit hole or a mud hole as oh, Chris yeah. would say. That's a that's, yeah, that's, a that's a massive mud hole if you want to try to get it down to exactly 
the thousands of an inch and or hundreds of thousands of an inch and trying to get it that specific i figure if now, you're longer than a tenth of an inch or let you know greater than a tenth yeah. of an inch and that that know. doesn't bring a that does bring a good point, Brian, that, that we have a very vast knowledge base. And if you have issues like that, support at thunderlaserusa.com may be your answer because you'll have at least two engineers and some, uh, a dumb landscaper, me, uh, looking at it, trying to help you. Yeah. And that's what these meetings are for too. It's the point of, ants getting questions answered like that because it is an anomaly unless you run into something like i did and it just shows up because you're trying to stack them all up nice and neat to hand them to your wife to take them to somebody and you're going well wait a minute why is this one a little bit longer and then you go to measure and then you're noticing the weird anomalies <clears throat> you know it's only going to become really bad i guess for you is if you're doing a production run for a customer and you're turning things one way or another and or they're being so precise that they actually need that 14 inches and need it within a thousandth of an inch yeah. and then you're going to have to tweak it so i'll get on the soapbox that's why i don't like these nesting apps that rotate things like the docking stuff looks pretty cool built in because it keeps everything oriented right especially for engraving but also for cutting if you're off in a given direction some people do those little box fit things and all that with the weird edges you know orientation matters now the other thing you got to consider jim um your y-axis squareness as well um that is your longer axis right the gantry span so there's also getting that in line because it's driven by two belts uh, what people notice if they cut a large square or rectangle if you flip it over and try to put it back in the pocket but rotate it and it doesn't go in the pocket because it's kind of like a, I don't know, is it a rhombus or whatever where the sides yeah. are shifted? That's another calibration to do. And really, you ought to do that before you do the other stuff, right? So getting everything square and then fixing the dimensions and taking, I was, taking grip into it. I was lucky. The corner to corner, side to good. side, I was good. It was literally yeah. just the links on mine. But, yeah, you're exactly right on worrying about top to bottom corner to corner making sure that you are actually square or they are equaling each other to know that you are square before you start trying to get perfection on your length the distances that's a good and, point and the other fun thing that also plays into alignment so if your y-axis as it goes to the right starts drifting you know closer or further away from the front or back of the machine because that gantry is not square that can mess with your alignment you'll you'll have the dot right but as it gets to the other end it shifts over a couple millimeters so you got to get that right as well yeah i haven't tweaked um, that so we've got a question uh ronnie was asking about if there was a video for cleaning or lubrication or preventative maintenance and things like that not a video per se um that might be something we can look at uh cleaning it's kind of a i, I don't know i might have cleaned my machine twice ever so i'm not an expert at it um, I use LA Totally Awesome um, and, and uh, a microfiber cloth uh, for most of my stuff. Um, as far as lubrication, the only thing that really truly gets lubricated are the Z-axis lead screws, the big four screws in each corner of the bed, and they need to be lubricated. Um, everything else needs to stay clean. They do show in the PM, we do have a preventative maintenance article, and I can link that article. It's may I don't think it, it may have a few videos in it. Um, not, not sure if it's exactly what you're looking for. And what about the thing, thing I would suggest on cleaning twos, if you are going to use an air compressor with a nozzle, do not blast use soft air because if you have any air fine particles, you will drive them into places they don't need to be driven. So if you're using soft, if you're using a compressor to blow things out, use a soft air and not a full blast air. What about the Bearing tracks. So they show in the preventative maintenance article about applying some lubricant to those steel rails that are pressed into that aluminum gantry. 
uh, but that's more for to that's more to prohibit uh, corrosion from the dissimilar metals being there touching each other. Not so much for lubrication. Now that's not to say that those uh, U groove bearings won't squeak on those stainless steel rails every once in a while and chatter and make a little racket. So it could help with that, but the, it's not going to be for a true lubrication purposes. All of those bearings are sealed and self lubricating. So. Then as you're cleaning, we, we've seen it often, um, your end stop switches, they're, they're fragile, right? So a lot of times people, oh, I just cleaned my machine and now it's, you know, my X axis no longer works because they, when they wipe the rag, they basically overextended the end stop arm and it no longer clicks and functions. Yeah, right there. Oh, oh easy, easy. That one, that's it. So he's giving a yeah, demonstration. Be careful. Yeah, be very I'll... careful over there. So. But I've also found really awesome, works phenomenal, even better than isopropyl alcohol, um, as far as cleaning goes. And it's not flammable. So if there's any residual left in there, it's it, not supposed to. It works to on the blades too. Up. It cleans the blades off good and the honeycomb. I usually hit mine with a pressure washer. I haven't yet, but I, I will. I will hit my bed with a, a pressure washer once I clean it. <laughs> Like a mattress. Can we just flip this thing over and? Yeah. Well, I need to because mine's been crashed ever since the first month I had it. Yeah. It's all bent over in the back, but it works. I'm, I'll leave it alone. Except for the new mattresses, you can't flip them over. Oh, of course. They're all one sided. Of course. What a money racket. You, know, you, you have to rotate them in circles. That's <laughs> all you can do to them anymore. But they don't make them square, so you, you got to rotate 180 at a time. Yeah. What if, Your so, mattress is like a is our mattress is almost like 18 inches thick. Yeah. And then our bed, because our bed, my wife has problems even getting into our bed because our box springs and mattress is so thick. Well, I killed another few minutes with that little one. <laughs> Well, we can have 10 more minutes of happy birthday to Brian. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, what was that, Julia? I have a question about cutting acrylic, just because it's something that's really new for me. Um, okay. Is it, is it, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not clear on whether you should go ahead and cut with the masking that it comes on, or if you should do the dish soap thing, or that everybody seems to have a different opinion and nobody really yeah. seems to have a reason why things need to be done that way. <laughs> so... I like acrylic. That's one of the things that I actually can do, and I, I enjoy it. Um, if you're going to engrave it, I pull the masking off of the top. And, of course, I engrave it with it mirrored so that when you're looking through the acrylic, you know, the smooth side is, is facing you. But I'll, I'll leave the paper on the bottom side and lay it on the laser if, if I'm engraving on that side. I just did templates for... Um like for some quilting ladies this week and i'm so stupid i never even thought about like doing like from the back side doing the engraving from the back side yeah. but that was hard to clean because i left the masking on <clears throat> yeah and it was clear acrylic and getting that adhesive and that masking off of there after the fact was a nightmare mm -hmm. i scratched now, the crap out of it yeah and and acrylic's weird because you kind of want to powder that if you if you hit it with too much heat too slow it's going to get sticky you know, and especially if you leave the paper on, I don't like engraving anything with the paper on. I think that it just burns, you know, that paper's got to kind of burn a little bit in the adhesive and whatnot. Um, it, if I'm engraving, I'm always trying to get barely any depth at all. I, Cause I do a lot of edge lit. If I do any acrylic, it's usually edge lit and that works real well. You, you just basically want to frost it. You're not looking for a lot of depth. The more depth you're looking for, the more you're going to heat that acrylic up and you may not get that chalky, nice, smooth, contrasting appearance that you want. But a lot of that also has to do with yeah. the air. You're also Can blocking you, and, the light that flows through it. Yeah. That's, yeah. Oh, I didn't even think of that. Um, can you like for single like for um specifically what i was doing for the quilting templates can you use single line fonts and score those or do they require an engrave to be seen a little bit better have you, you tried mean, either one i haven't i haven't tried i mean you can do a single line font on it or just look a, a little score it'll be up to you to get that power low enough you know where it doesn't cut all the way through you know however you get that adjusted yeah i haven't tried score lines on acrylic uh okay. i haven't never ever needed to that'd be one of those things you may just have to 
experiment with. I'll play with it. It'd be it. a lot faster, yeah. you know, oh if it's just gosh. for, yeah. For just those templates. Well, yeah. I mean, that single line I'm and, doing um, on wedding signs, I've started taking offering like on the back side of them to do, to score a single line font. And then people can, instead of including a wedding card, they essentially write their message. And then I, I flipped a piece and scored on the backside and it's so successful once I got my settings down for that. So maybe yeah. I'll play with that so to see if I can with acrylic. What, what thickness acrylic are you cutting? Uh, I, yesterday they just wanted eighth inch. Okay. So if you cut something like quarter inch or something, I usually won't even bother with it for eighth, but quarter inch and up, if you focus into the center of the material, take quarter inch, yeah. for instance, you're six millimeters or a quarter inch from the nozzle to the surface material of the material for a normal focus at the surface. If you focus three millimeters down or an eighth of an inch down, you're going to be focused to the center of that acrylic and that's going to be the hottest spot. So it'll help with your cut. It'll also defocus your a little bit if you're going to be doing engraving if you're doing single line fonts it'll defocus you by three millimeters okay. you see what i mean so your yeah. beam will be fatter you'll be using a sharpie instead of a mechanical pencil gotcha. on the surface okay. so the single line font may look decent in acrylic that way okay that's good to know thank you and because you, you could also defocus the other way you could focus <laughs> away from the material a couple of inches but if you're gonna you can combine the process if it works out with if you're you know, dialing in to get your cut. If your defocus amount is the same, does that make sense? Cause yeah, you can... we did our one hour training and one of the first things I ever learned from you is drop half the distance. And that's given me the best, I mean, yeah. perfect cuts. Yesterday I did try to defocus to seven, um, to see if I could get that a little, like mm -hmm. I was looking for a smoother edge along the cut line part of it. Gotcha. I, like I said, I'm pretty inexperienced with working with acrylic, but that was my, I didn't think about defocusing closer. I had thought about doing it farther away. So I'll, I'll yeah. place it, I'll give it a try. Two, two millimeters focused in or two millimeters focused out will give you about the same result of a spot on the surface of the material. It'll just matter <laughs> if you focusing in to cut. If I'm gonna do a cup, for instance, I focus out if I'm gonna defocus on a cup because I don't want to focus into the stainless. I can't do anything to it anyway, even right, though the dot size would theoretically be the same, you know, whether you're positive two or negative two, provided okay. the lens, you know, converged and diverged equally, which it, I think it kind of does. Okay. So. Cool. And then Thank for you. your okay, acrylic well. edge, low air, wide nozzle. Low air. So farther yeah. you said for the, for the smooth edge, Chris? Well, I, I, I cut closer when I do cuts, I, I get closer, Okay. but the low air pressure, wide nozzle and just watch for fires and flames, but that's oh, going to give you that, that polished edge. For? Well, it's generally an engraving nozzle. Yeah. But for yeah. acrylic, it, it helps to let the air diffuse out. So you don't get that frosted edge and it just, it just looks better. On okay. The yeah. It'll look like glass on the edge. Yep. Got ya. Okay. Is that thing showing up? Yeah. So yep. this you can actually see through. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. Um, this at the bottom, there's paper on it. And this at the bottom is where the laser beam has hit the, the honeycomb and bounced back up from the bottom and taken little chunks out. That um, huh. the striations that are there are actually from a factory <laughs> edge that was cut on a table saw. That's on the other side. You're seeing all the way through but that is absolutely smooth, crystal clear right here. A nice flame polished edge. Now at the top, you'll notice that it looks really crispy and crunchy and it, you can't see through it. That's because you put so much air on that. It solidified it before it was able to melt together and give you that nice flame polished edge. So if okay. you see a condition where the top of your acrylic looks like you chewed it up, that means you're using too much air, but there's a balancing point there. You want to use just enough air to mitigate the flames and flare ups, but not enough to be able to, you know, uh, to have that happen to your, to your work. And it's a balancing act with acrylic because especially if you don't stand the acrylic off of the honeycomb so that it can get air directly underneath it, some of that stuff is still combustible and it kind of cavitates in the pockets of the honeycomb you know, with the Elevated. material laying over it, especially if it's a large piece and you'll see those flames and flashes, all, you know, where it's igniting that stuff under the bottom. And that can even cause a fire on your paper 
if you don't want. So my husband is a um, 25 year veteran firefighter, and I happened to mention mention uh, vapors getting trapped with the honeycomb yesterday, and that got me a really, really, really long lecture about vapors. <laughs> and <laughs> so you, you've probably memorized the fire tetrahedron a time or two. Okay. <laughs> hey, Brian, you know, I, I've seen there's this digital pressure gauge that you could buy that you can hook up to your laser machine so you can get repeatable exact pre, uh, air pressure for yep. a job. They do have those. I've seen them on Etsy. I think In, I think there's a nice <laughs> kit that's actually made plug, plug, Chris. And I think Brian's got an article on that. And they you work know, great. I bought one. Have you gotten Two it yet? I got mine in the mail. Did you? Yeah, I have to hook it up. The, I'm waiting for the guy to post a video on how to install it correctly. That's all. Oh, you need a video? <laughs> uh, I was the Damn. I was the maker. Was was your OEM vendor supposed to have some documentation for you? He has it's on the it. QR code. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it's four o'clock. I'm hitting the button. Hang tight a second. It's five o'clock. 